So uh, today, so with my colleague uh, Zach Danset from the Brown University, we will speak of how ontologies uh, can be used to overcome the problem of interoperability. Uh, Javier Ruiz Perez uh, from the Texas AMN University uh, contributed also to this uh, presentation. So in the context of uh, digital transitions, open science principles and ontologies are valuable tools uh, to maximize the benefits for research. It is not a question of reinventing the wheel, but rather of implementing shared thinkings about how we can improve the way we work uh, with humans and machines in phytoid research. If uh, digital work is well understood and applied, it will really positively impact uh, and transform our, our, our way of working. So uh, the Open Factorit uh, Committee was recently created to improve responsible science practice in the factorit research. We do have a website and a YouTube channel so where you can find training videos, and uh, we I put the link uh, directly on the on the on the presentation, and you have it also on the Google Doc. So I'm a member of uh, ICOPS and some of us, uh, Emma Caroon, Zach. Uh, Carla Lancelotti and Javier Ruiz Perez are working with uh, Henriette Arms on the implementations of ontologies to improve the inter interoperability of phytolite research. Henriette is uh, really helping us to design our ontologies and uh, she's really teaching us how to create uh, these ontologies. So you can read more about uh, her work. And uh, uh, because she, she have a website and uh, I also had a link uh, to our GitHub repository. Uh, it's still uh, really at the beginning and it's still a work in progress, but as we are working transparently, uh, I saw it will be nice for, to, for you to have a look at it. And uh, so I will leave the floor to Zach uh, right now. So I stop sharing. Sure, and sorry, let me share again. Yes. I think we can share the same. Okay, if you want, yeah. or just let so. me know. Okay, you guys can see my screen again. Looks yes. good. Okay, yes. and I can see my notes, so that's perfect. So I really wanted to like make this as a very kind of basic reason of why we are making this an ontology with a lot of stuff about where we are coming from, both me and Celine in different ways. I'll mostly talk about my own thing. So we, all of us that are familiar with phytoliths, you know, we know that we have this kind of black box problem. We have some samples, we have some kind of analyses, which we don't often explain very well, and we have interpretation. And there's many points in this part that can have problems uh, occur, especially in how we're communicating our information, our data sets, and our information. So this is one of the things that ontologies can help us with. Excuse me, as we go. So one of the big things that we came into and why I'm personally interested in this so much is how do we start opening this black box? How do we make interpretation and especially reuse of our data possible through ontologies? Now, whoops, I went too far. Uh, excuse me, sorry. So as kind of some background in this, you know, we have a humongous increase in phytolith research and researchers around the world. If we look at this map from the um, IPS, uh, International Phytolith Society, we can see the distribution of phytolith researchers around the world, or at least where they are located, not necessarily where research is occurring. Um, some things that we can see is that, you know, we have tons of papers coming out. Um, 91 papers were archived by the IPS in Phytolith Research in 2021. If we look at just Google Scholar data, we have 2,700 articles were published in just 20, 2022 alone, including Phytoliths or mentioning Phytoliths in some way. We have 8,000 plus articles already archived by the International Phytolith Society, and 24,000, almost 25,000 uh, articles have been published about phytoliths or referencing phytoliths according to Google Scholar. Um, I'm kind of hiding, I guess my 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 chart here is kind of hiding uh, the increase. But what we have seen since the late 90s is that phytolith science is exploding. More people are doing it, more research, but with this research is coming its own kind of um, growing pains. 
and what we can do with this. So we have many barriers that are kind of keeping us from specific types of uh, open vitalist science. You know, first we have these vitalist schools. We have different, you know, since at least the 1960s, vitalist science and especially vitalist science in archaeology has developed in different parts of the world. Um, each of them has been characterized by their own terminologies, their ways of analyses and interpretation. Communicating between these regions can be difficult. And this is one of the things that we think that interoperability of ontologies can help us with, both on kind of a global context, but also on a local context between different languages. Uh, Henriette showed us a nice example of that in her um, work. And put this in kind of perspective, I just want to show kind of what it looks like. Uh, Luke very nicely talked about um, how the terminology and the standardization of, of phytoliths has changed. But if we look at kind of the long history of phytoliths, we see that we, even in English, we're not talking in the same language. So this um, phytolith on the right is a very common phytolith. Um, even for those who are not really familiar with phytoliths, you can see that it can be described as longer than it is wide. It's characterized by these kind of regular spikes or protrusions along its margins. But there are many ways we could describe this if we're just using English as our descripting language. To the left here, I have a, a word cloud taken from 15 synonyms from the ICPN 2.0 of the same morphotype over the last 50 years. And what we can see is how many different words have been used to describe the same phytolith. For just kind of direct examples, you know, we have something as simple as elongate spiny with pavement to things like tabular parallel pedal bodies with echinate margins. This is, of course, very hard when we're trying to communicate phytoliths more simply between different people. Now, as Luke really did go into quite nice detail, in 2005, we had one, uh, the first kind of uh, attempt at standardizing nomenclature and taxonomy about phytoliths, and in 2019, uh, this changed. Um, this change, though, causes its own barriers. I, I use myself as an example for um, during my PhD, my master's and PhD, I learned under the International Code for Phytolith Nomenclature 1.0. So I learned of this type of phytolith being called an elongate echinate long cell. By the time I was finishing my PhD, the name has changed. And this becomes a kind of barrier that we have to relearn it each time we have a new iteration. The work of standardizing this is very, very valuable, but it makes it causes difficulties in um, in our research. So there's also difficulties of equating older nomenclatures with and taxonomies with these new terms. And also there has been, you know, in some cases, resistance to adoption of the new terms in the phytolith community. And these are things that we can move forward from using ontologies. So how do we communicate better? And I leave this then and open it up to Celine again. Uh, Celine, do you want me to share or allow yeah. me to share? Well, Sorry. yes, if you would like. So it will be maybe uh, more fluid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, oh, wait. We'll just share my screen again. Okay. So, just a few words about open science because it's uh, this is also uh, important to speak of it. Uh, this is a set of principles and tools that can really help us to improve the way we are working together. And the fair principles are, uh, is one of them. So it is not about uh, making all the data open, but uh, to make them as open as possible and of course as close as necessary. In practice, uh, for us, it is more about making the information about the data so the metadata openly available so that other researchers can understand what data and how data was collected, for example. So metadata can be used to fully describe any uh, kind of data set, including any specifics about the kind of data, research steps, uh, data locations, among other uh, uh, possibilities. But its presentations really matters as it plays uh, an important role in the interoperability of data, especially if the data is not accessible. So interoperability clearly defines how we can exchange data and metadata and how users can combine and make use of the information. 
So uh, the interoperability concept uh, uh, was defined by Wilkinson uh, in 2016, uh, according to these uh, three points. Uh, first one is data and metadata uh, use a formal, accessible, shared, broadly applicable languages for knowledge representation. A second point is data and metadata use vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles. And the third point is data and metadata include qualified references to other data and metadata. So uh, as Dr. Gonzalez Beltran uh, pointed out, it's those two points uh, focus on making the data unambiguous and comprehensible. While the third it focuses more on the interoperability of data and metadata. So to, to, to give you an image, it is similar to the knowledge that goes into, uh, into a cooking recipe. You would rather know uh, what are the ingredients contained in a food can to properly cook it. So uh, why do phytoliths need ontologies? Uh, this is a question we think it is important to ask at this moment. So uh, of course, my colleague Zach already explained a lot and uh, uh, looked before uh, a little bit about the whole history about the phytolith research, but this uh, field of discipline has evolved quite quickly uh, in the last two decades. So, and it's also used in a really wide range of disciplines such as archeology, span of course, uh, ecologies, plant morphologies, uh, geochemistry. So the aims and methods used to answer all the, these research questions are very different and have uh, resulted in, of course, in the dispersions of methods and terminologies. So there is uh, the two nomenclature uh, that exist to standardize the phytolith naming, but those are limited to certain morphotypes and taxonomic group, as uh, Luc uh, already explained. Ontology can be used uh, to map all these names used in phytoid research to identify them as synonyms. ICPN could, of course, be used to structure uh, those terms within a hierarchy. And uh, as Henriette uh, uh, said before also, ontologies can be multilingual. So for us, it's quite valuable because we are working in different countries, as uh, Zach already pointed out also. So, and there is a third uh, issue that I wanted to raise is, uh, is uh, that vital researchers are uh, concretely, concretely facing uh, another challenge with uh, multiplicity and uh, redundancy issues. So uh, multiplicity uh, happens when different phytoliths are produced by the same plant and redundancy happens when different plants can produce the same phytoliths. So, this is not hard to imagine how it is challenging for a phytolith identification. So, and ontologies can, might be a solution because it can link uh, multiple concepts together. And in this precise case, might help us to map redundancy and multiplicity specifics by bridging the various level of uh, taxonomical identification issues. So uh, uh, a quick word about the FAIR project, uh, uh, because in, in the FAIR project, we have launched uh, studies of uh, 100 papers published between 2016 and 2020. Uh, this is to assess how phytolith data are FAIR, and uh, these uh, 100 articles are from Europe and uh, South America, and they were evaluated using uh, a questionnaire developed for this purpose. These two regions uh, have been chosen uh, because they have uh, really different uh, working traditions. And uh, this is more uh, a tool to have a state of the art of phytolith research practices in terms of fair principles. So we aim to improve our practice and huh, not to judge, uh, not to judge it. So I am pleased to present uh, some of uh, our preliminary results. Uh, as we believe it can help uh, to better understand how we can improve the way we work together. So first, uh, we, in this study, we check out about the findabilities of uh, uh, phytolith uh, uh, data by looking uh, at its open access uh, status. And we, we find out that 54% uh, are our close access. This means that we, of course, we have like only 40% uh, uh, of the articles that are of open access. So it's just to give you a, a landscape uh, about the situation to, to just to find 
uh, data. Secondly, for assessing the accessibility of uh, data, we looked at um, uh, where the data were made available. And we there was like 38 percent uh, were uh, table uh, stored uh, within the text of the article. 35 percent were graph. 26 were stored in a supplementary material of the articles, and just one percent uh, uh, was stored in a in a in a repository. So this is just to say it is important to access the raw data. Uh, as it is a type of data that we can really reuse uh, because it is, of course, very difficult to reuse data that are uh, expressed uh, uh, within a graph. Uh, third point, uh, to, uh, to assess the interoperability of phytolith data, we, for example, check out whether or not uh, images of phytolith were made available. And 26 of the article we, we looked at show all the phytolith mentioned in the article. 52 show the most of the significant images, and 22 show absolutely no images. So this is, again, something uh, uh, interesting to, uh, to think of. Um, and finally, to check uh, the reusability of the data, we specifically looked at uh, uh, if there was a data availability statement, so DAS, indicating how to reuse the data in the article. Uh, so 12% of uh, DAS were found in the articles, 5% were found under request, and 1% was found in a repository, but that means also that 82% did not show any DAS. So, so this is the selections of, uh, of the results, of the preliminary results uh, that we got so far. And uh, this is to say that we really need a change of cultures in the way we are sharing uh, phytolit data. So just again, um, the quick word about ontology, but I, I guess oh, uh, Frances and Henriette uh, made really a clear point. This is just to speak a little bit again, again about the ontology. And these uh, uh, pictures explain how ontologies works and how they are different from uh, thesauries, for example. Uh, so they are made up of concepts. Uh, properties and relations. It is not only the identifications and the classifications of concepts that matter, but also the properties uh, and attached to them. So for me, it's easier to think about properties as attributes or characteristics uh, related to concepts that can establish kind of rules or uh, constraints uh, that will form the extension of the concept. For example, <clears throat> an apple is a concept related to a fruit, but it is also related to food, and it can also represent all kinds of apple species. So, uh, and for uh, making it uh, really powerful, you can add axioms to improve your ontologies, and the axiom will uh, exclude irrelevant terms, uh, and they work as a, a statement that says uh, what is true, from what is fault in a, in a domain. Uh, therefore, this is really helping uh, to detect uh, inconsistencies uh, between terms. And uh, this is also why ontologies uh, uh, use, uh, as already, uh, uh, Henriette already spoke of it, uh, all uh, format, which is uh, ontology web languages, because all, all this can be translated into mathematical logic axioms. So, this is uh, um, uh, where we are a bit uh, right now. We have started to work uh, uh, in a small team to, to create an ontology for phytolith. So this is what we think uh, on the left side, what could be uh, our uh, structures for the phytolith ontology. And also on the right part, you see uh, that we need uh, a kind of uh, uh, database to run uh, this, uh, these ontologies. So you can see that each phytolit morphotype uh, got uh, unique identifiers that ensures uh, the traceability and also the sustainability of its life cycle over time. Uh, if, for example, if the naming convention change again, the identification will remain the same, and all the informat informations and the data or metadata attached to, to it 
will remain the same or, or as well. So this is quite something uh, powerful at the stage of, uh, of our research. So uh, I had uh, this slide also to, um, to show that ontologies are used in uh, many fields of science and that they are quite uh, really helpful to manage uh, big data. Uh, so they clearly improve the comp compatibilities uh, between concepts and terms of quite different uh, uh, kind of uh, applications. In archaeology, uh, there is a linked open data example, uh, which is uh, going fully open. So this is quite interesting also to, to have a look on it. I, I had the link uh, of this uh, uh, to the article. So this is, of course, not always possible in our field of research, but at least it, uh, it gives a, a good example of how ontology can improve the data accessibility and interoperability. I also had an example of uh, plant ontologies, which is coming from the EMB, uh, EMBL EBI website, in which you can see how ontology are structures in a tree mapping. And uh, this is of interest uh, when you think of the improved results that we can obtain while linking phytolith ontologies, for an example, to a plant anatomy uh, uh, one. So we have also this uh, workflow uh, that summarizes a little bit uh, uh, our work. And uh, this is what we are trying to implement uh, with the phytolith ontologies. And we are really uh, only at the beginning of this adventure. So, uh, the phase ones uh, aim at designing them. It is uh, exactly where we are. And uh, if we agree on these structures, we will move on to phase two, uh, which is more about developing the ontology by integrating the published resources and to, by implementing also all this data with, within the software. Uh, this step, of course, requires uh, an evaluation and uh, agreement. And the phase three uh, uh, describes uh, the use of ontology by users. Uh, it is necessary to, to think about the maintenance uh, of ontology because we have to consider them more uh, such as a living knowledge that needs to be uh, updated uh, frequently. So this is a little bit uh, um, uh, about uh, where we are. And uh, just the last uh, slide. Uh, because, uh, of course, it is uh, clear that we will need uh, uh, more time, uh, much more, more time to properly implement uh, uh, this kind of ontologies. And uh, because also we want it to be a uh, community based. So it's also need to be managed within uh, its own database. So all that will be will take, obviously, time. So in the meantime, we were uh, thinking about what can be done to improve uh, the interoperability interoperability of phytolith research. So some actions can be easily uh, implemented. So uh, such of course as the first thing is to use the use of the existing nomenclature, which is quite important. And if you can't really use uh, in your article the nomenclature, you can express uh, you can express this nomenclature in a, in a table, for example, with a column stating the ICPN synonym. And you can share uh, a picture of the phytolith uh, or morphotypes. And uh, what is, could be important is to consider uh, putting this table in a machine readable format, uh, such as a CSV file or a TSV file format, and not only, uh, only uh, within the PDF files. Uh, this will allow, for example, uh, better findability of your work and consequently increase the uh, interoperability of your data set. So it is important to increase the use of metadata, obviously, uh, because well-described metadata are processable by computers and uh, that without human interventions. And the systematic publication of uh, fatalist pictures will help us to ensure uh, we are speaking about uh, the same uh, fatalist and will improve our confidence uh, in uh, co-working, of course. And besides journals and other possibility, it exists uh, uh, other database. Uh, Luke was uh, speaking about Fitcore, was well, is a good way to share your pictures. And uh, you have already other uh, open database or trustworthy repository where you can really add as much as you want of uh, phytolith pictures. So this is it. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, we are really happy to answer uh, any questions so you might have.
So. <laughs> <laughs> Jam. Got a question. We got thanks again for saying that's a tremendous amount of work you went through, I guess, to go through all that uh, literature and element. And as are you going to? Because um, Zach mentioned a, a site of data which contain already some images. Are you going to try to chase more to get more of that substance, making the domain fair and say, okay, to contact the original author and say, okay, we can see in the paper, there is no images. Do you have them? Do you want to put them somewhere for reuse? Or, or is that just a, all your suggestion is from now on and try not to get the, the knowledge back, which which is also be will be absolutely fair because that effort will be probably worse than the one you have already went through. So it's just kind of idea of what is your plan, guidance or trying to get information from the past, basically, which is already difficult, I guess. Yeah, I think guidance will be the first step to to uh, to achieve, and uh, and then we will uh, certainly need to find some fundings to uh, <laughs> to properly work uh, uh, full time on this, and maybe to employ you know like people to maybe to contact other vital researchers, and uh, when we spot missing information, and uh, yes, of course, because there are a lot of uh, great literatures also in our field, and uh, certainly it's just a matter to to unit a little bit uh, uh, factory database images, which are uh, somewhere in the hard drive or a computer or someone, and we just needs to be uh, uh, put online and, uh, and uh, properly uh, connected. Yeah, I think it's, as, it's, it's always, you need to show the benefit of doing that because you are, will be asking people to do more work. And I think what you have already shown is great. And I think if you can show that if you, do something you can achieve great work people will be more likely to join the jump on the train i would say but it's it's a tremendous tremendous amount of work in such a short uh, period of time because I remember when you started if you, what emma was saying it was a different landscape i would say that's great yes. well, yeah totally different that's really, yes, great work thank you very much thank you Carla. Hi, uh, I just wanted to, I mean, to highlight uh, the fact, well, thank, thank Luke for being here in the representation of the ICPN committee. And I think that his talk has actually shown us that uh, uh, ICPN too can be a great basis where to start from for building our own ontology. And because uh, there's, there, that's what they've been doing basically, right? When, you know, with the collection of all the synonyms and the descriptions and things like this. So they've already like put the basis uh, for it. The, the, what, what we would like to do going forward is more uh, making this type of work more accessible, like easily accessible and, and you know, and use, uh, use the tools that are available in in terms of you know online tools and ontology, what Henriette was showing, etc., uh, to basically facilitate even more the work of the ICPN. That's why I think it's very important that Luke was here today and that he could show us um, and, and explain how ICPN work. I mean, we all kind of know, <laughs> we, we all know how it works and that we're all using it, but I think that it was really a good talk that you know made made very visible uh, the synergies that can be uh, put in place between the ICOPS committee and the ICPN committee because I think that this is uh, this is something that needs uh, you know a, a work that needs to be done together in conjunction and I'm really sorry that uh, um, Rosa Maria Albert couldn't be here today Rosa Maria Albert she is the uh, the person who put together the image database that uh, um, both Luke and uh, and Celine were talking about the fight core and uh, I know that she's really interested in in uh, in understanding how this uh, database can be uh, put into uh, like more even greater use than it's it's already uh, been used for. So uh, maybe that's something also to think about uh, uh, for for the work in the in the near future um, to involve her as as representative for the fit core uh, 
database. And maybe get back to Jean Marie and Francis <laughs> once once she is more in <laughs> in the loop <laughs> and see how we can collaborate with you as well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Carla is definitely 100% right. We've been basing this completely on the ICPN 2.0 uh, information, and that is kind of our starting point. And we think it's a great way that we can build from that and connect it to the other information because the, the text is so dense. Uh, we can make this hierarchy out of what has already been illustrated. And I think it would be a really powerful thing to connect both new and old data uh, within this ontology. So. So I would guess I would also like to say thanks, Luke, and the team for, for making something so useful for us. Yeah. Henriette, I think, was wanted to talk. Um, so I want to first of all say that um, I've actually enjoyed working on this project up to now, because first of all, when I started with this, I had no clue what a fighter lift is. Um, that was the one thing. And secondly, I've asked uh, Celine, well, how do I start with it? And what did you provide me with? The ICPN. <laughs> and, so, and I actually read through it, <laughs> both of them. So yeah. Um, but then what I just want to ask from your experience now with this, um, I mean, you've had very little experience with ontologies beforehand. Um, so what would you say has been the biggest learning curve for you in starting to use ontologies and if we uh, for future reference for myself really is how could we actually improve on that experience oh i i might be a little bit specific about it but uh, uh, for me uh, i'm i'm quite uh, uh, I would I would really like to 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 solve the multiplicity and redundancy issues that we are really facing because there is a lot of information that are actually lost because of the specifics of uh, pythonids. And uh, uh, when we met during the hackathon, so it's been more than a year, I think. We it's the first idea across my mind because we've uh, your data related example. Uh, I saw there, there there was might be a way to. To figure out what what we can do with uh, this uh, uh, phytolith, which are a little bit uh, uh, not of great use right now, so I would say this one will be uh, would be great. Yeah, but this is quite specific. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yes, Gabby. If, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, Gabby. Yeah. Uh, hello. Can I speak in Spanish? And the translator translate me. Okay. La pregunta es, eh, en los casos en que no tengamos eh, el uso del código eh, en los papers, ¿qué, ¿qué estrategias se les ocurren que podemos empezar a utilizar para lograr esta traducción? Y, y no, es ok, es ok. Eh, imágenes, eh, sinonimias, ¿qué estrategias se les ocurren? Uh, I'm not sure uh, you, uh, you, 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 you are thinking about the, the, the strategy. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, to start uh, to uh, think in all together, uh, yes. especially, you know, the South American Fighterly School is so particular. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, what, what Gabby was, uh, was asking was, uh, what, what, what is your suggestion, your meaning, Henriette and Jean-Marie, uh, for, uh, you know, how to basically Gabby if I, if I understood correctly how to translate let's say data from old publication into once we have an ontology you know with codes and everything how to translate in a certain sense old publication data that don't have this code into you know the the new ontology code in a sense she was saying maybe using the images maybe you know using yeah, I, th I think that's going to be a, 
is one of the challenge. Uh, uh, you want to go ahead, Frances? Or I was. Um, I was going to say about ontology trees and things. So you would build it from there. I've built. I've not built a plant ontology before, but I've built um, other ontologies. So um, I would start with like an ontology tree and build it from there. So add in your new terms that don't have identifiers. And then once you add in a, a term to the branch of the tree, then you can put in a new identifier. I'm not sure if that's the correct way to do it, but that's the way that I've done it previously. Yeah, I suppose the part where I'm unsure is um, what Francis is saying is exactly right. You basically start creating this tree of ontology. Um, but the problem is you still have the old data um, and you probably would want to try and update that and annotate that with the appropriate term from your ontology. Um, I, I don't see any other way to get that data into or aligned with the ontology. But there's a way to keep an old identifier and to also have an update it with a new one so that you see both identifiers, I think. Yes. So the problem that I see at the moment, though, is that um, if you look at the publications, they probably refer to the um, uh, text, um, the string of text, um, and that will not link to the um, identifier in the ontology. So somewhere we will actually, for the data at least, have to link that to the identifier if you want to make everything searchable in the same way um, and linkable in the same way. Okay, any last questions? No? No, I think it's more what a comment that what Celine was saying, we don't, you will need some people and manpower at some stage to do all that because that's not, a computer will not be able to do it for you. Uh, unfortunately, for many things, it's going to be, at least for the, for the first few paper, I would think that you need a lot of consultation and agree not after that, from history, because I would imagine um, in you, you might see some trend from, I don't know, uh, uh, Celine indicated older paper, you know, 80s, 90s, people were using certain terminology. And then if you have an area, or, you know, not maybe not decades, but time, time area where you could say, okay, that term X was matching to term Y now, and you got one or two examples, people might be able to help. Uh, and do it do it themselves by mimicking but it is going to be a a bit of a human effort in the first first instance so hopefully and, some funding will come and also yes. what do you do with the existing images because i suppose there's images that are not computerized to start with or, or if they're computerized they're in an older format probably that might not be readable any longer yeah we have lots of stuff and especially the tough thing for us is much of the foundational work was either not photographed um and we have been referencing it you know as printed text uh or described or whatever um and as luke said you know even the early stuff was on cd which most of us don't have access to and even if we do do we have permission to use it because Maybe they're not researchers anymore or or what's going on. So we know that we have lots of kind of issues there. The flip side is we now also have such ease of access to digital photography. We can we can make our own reference databases far easier than we could 10 years ago, whatever. Um, and I think all of us have done that who are active Phytolith researchers in some way. So it exists, it just hasn't been brought together anywhere. 
uh, other than fight core, but that has been maintained by um, uh, like kind of voluntary work in that way. But would you say in that case that the, the potential hurdle will be the agreement from the initial author to have the to convert this data because yeah even if it's just taking a digital photograph with the phone you will have a very decent quality now okay it might not be the original format but you will get a still a fairly decent quality that people will be able to work with and even some do some analysis it will not get the accuracy that one would have loved to but you will get it so it'll be the, the consent that could be the hurdle is it there for you from your perspective yeah the original I'm, author I I mean, I don't know. I I, I yeah. actually don't see consent being such a big issue with all of us, but it's getting okay. us to communicate really is maybe in bringing it together, right? I mean, Carla, Gisseline, I would you agree? Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I would agree. And uh, this is uh, something uh, uh, important to think of right now. And uh, but th th there are even uh, you know like a uh, new uh, new. Because you have a lot of images which are stored also in the university that database, and uh, uh, some of them are almost dying. So it would be nice to to get in touch with the people who own those pictures, just to just not to lose more information. So and uh, maybe to to uh, to have a link. But there is also this uh, young researchers uh, who uh, who who's do, doing three uh, D uh, morphotype uh, images. Uh, Rosalie Hermans, I don't know if she's here today, but she she writes like a I think if I'm correct, a lot of uh, 3D images that might be useful for us, and uh, because uh, I think she got like 1,800 already. So, yeah, wow, <laughs> exactly. So there is uh, a lot of uh, different kind of uh, images support that we can think of. Yeah. Yes, Luke. If, if I may, uh, a good starting point could be the the fight for from Rosa because um, it's not just picture coming from Rosa. Uh, she, people all around the world have been sharing and giving picture to Rosa. And the starting point of her DB has been the CD she published for her PhD quite, I think, something like 20 years ago. Yeah. So yes, indeed, uh, you do have different quality in picture, but that's reflect what the, the, the tool we get at the time we start with Fractalis. And there is somewhere no way to escape that and using that, unless you get the opportunity to go back to the reference collection that have been built at that time and taking new picture. Uh, but I think you can escape Rosa's one as it's so far the largest free access DB as to what concerns fight with. Maybe two, maybe there is maybe another one, uh, which is the one of the Missouri Botanical Garden put together by DB, where you have an old bunch of stuff too. And this, you, you know, using this 2db could have some interest in terms of uh because you won't if i really catch the problem behind ontologies it's what just we simply name synonym and homonyms and when you get things into those db you can easily go back to the publications of the paper that were published at that time because the names refers to as i slowly updating our db according to the icpn 2.0 which is currently no d official naming system uh, and that's maybe a way to start it's uh, it's it's moving too but i think you're mostly based in europe for what I think for the fair project. So Rosa is based in Barcelona. It, it should be the static point, contacting her, exchanging her, see what is possible. Well, I've been exchanging with her. She, she's also looking and wondering on how to, um, let us say, improve her DB. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You've been addressing uh, the problem maybe too with all these, uh, 
is that you still have quite a large range of basic of fundamental work that needs to be done on phytolites. Um, even to address the issues of redundancy and multiplicity, which has been frequently show up as being the major backdrop for taxonomical attributions. But finally, within our own research field, do we have the right understanding of multiplicity and redundancy? And uh, basically, if you think about uh, what's going on with all the plant remains, seed, uh, charcoal, pollen. In each of these fields, you have multiplicity and redundancy. It's just maybe the way it's expressed by phytolith that differ. And we need to jump and to dive into the logic of multiple uh, uh, on how phytolith express multiplicity and redundancy, which is just simply different that it, it goes in different research fields. And uh, so that's maybe the issue you need to, to tackle. And there have been once, uh, Terry Ball said there was so very interesting reference collections for the Dofar area, mm -hmm. uh, which to me uh, uh, was a nice way of tackling a few issues, one being in multiplicity and redundancy, because you get two ways to step in the DB. Either you went through the taxa and you get the whole set of picture of all the phytolith E extract from this taxa. Otherwise, you get another panel, another screen, where you get all the types of phytolith E observed in this DB, and you click on the picture, and you get all the taxa that in which these, from which these phytolith were extracted. And then you can you click again, you get the whole range of phytolith from this taxa. So that's the double entry. And this is, for me, one of the most practical ways it has ever done. Oh, all these are still on CD, though all these are still accessible. I have part of this stuff with me in my office, and you. But uh, I think before diving into such arborescent century things, there are maybe more than what people believe, which is accessible, a few more basic stuff that needs to be awake. Uh, we get last Wednesday an uh, ICPT meeting, and we came to the point that basically, for all those things that concern the big data stuff, Phytolit is decades away from. Even we have already a lot and much more, because if you see the the, the old list of publication, just go to the things you can access that has been put together by RANT, which is the bibliography, the reference list, list of phytolith publications six, 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 since the beginning. You have about 600 page of reference. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I think we, we, we have more. And uh, well, strikingly, also keep in mind that phytolith were discovered or were, yeah, discovered before pollen in the mid 19th. At that time, you get extraordinary people get time to look at their stuff. And that's something people don't do anymore on the microscope. It's taking the time to look at and gaining an understanding of the 3D shape of the phytoliths. But you get very clearly in all published drawings, if you go to the flan of paper, which backs to the end of the 50s, early 60s, did you ever look at this drawing? They are amazing. Yeah? And maybe consider in fact that in your DB, if you want to um, get a, a good clue on the phytolis, drawings, what about drawings? You have many of them we've been published. Good quality, less good quality, up quality. Yeah, you see the, if you go to the, uh, the paper that, um, Glenn Fredloom uh, published, I think it's in the 88, about the, the Great Great Plain, uh, 
to grass phytoliths and uh, the drawing made about this pipa, the crinate, the bilobates, they, they are the most amazing one to me that have ever been published because you get a clear 3D. And if you go with a image DB resource, image is a 2D, phytolith, it's a 3D object. And maybe one of the links you need, because that's sort of what I'm doing when I'm taking the picture. You play with the focus, and from the same object, you're taking different focus to get a good, good to gain a good understanding of your object. Yeah. No, and this this should be considered. It's, I mean, but basically, I think a good starting point would be contacting Rosa and asking it to see how to, to, to do, because there is a whole bunch of pictures and all recent, as I know that Caroline Stromberg gave her picture and all and all this. So, and she, she's searching a way to improve things. But, so, but Carla is already uh, yeah, speaking with Rosa, so that's why. Yeah. It's just... Uh, that's that's what I was saying before. You know, I've I've been in contact with Rosa for a while now, and she we had problem in meeting because she had uh, she she had some commitments, so she you know she she had problems in meeting. But we're meeting next week next week actually. And the idea here is not to create something new; is just to try and use it in the best possible way what's already been done. Because as you say, look, there's a lot of work done both on the image side, on the nomenclature side, you know, and it's not like we don't, we don't want to come and redo everything from the beginning. Actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's not that it's, it's more like what you were saying that we are, you know, we are years away of doing of, of using this in a sort of a, in a big data uh, sort of perspective but I, I don't think I, I i don't not necessarily agree with that i think that we need to start and that's you know that's uh what we are trying to do try to get all this amazing amount of work that's been done before both in terms of you know imaging and drawing and nomenclature and everything and use the tools that are available today to you know improve our accessibility and our way and the way we can use them and the way you know they can help us doing our research better that's that's the whole idea here it's uh, behind what we're trying to do I, and i don't know if jean marie wanted to say something because he has his just hands. a final comment is we have been there ourselves with idr because it was exactly the same thing people were sending us image file there's a big study was called was called Mitre Check at the time that nobody was publishing, and we received disk. So it's mm -hmm. and we, you know, Francis, it's not the in six years you can do, we've made a, a long, long progress. So I think, yeah, use what we have, publish, and then there's no it, it, it will come. And there's a lot of now the people weren't sending physically disk by post and then we were paying courier to get the disk so that's how it ended up and now people submit with very new uh, fancy mechanisms so uh, there's a, you need a starting point and you, everybody has been there so it'll be, exactly. it'll be a great effort guys, i should remind us that we are over time um <laughs> if there's any last comments or anything uh, i'd like to open this up and thank everyone thank you luke thank you jm thank you francis thank you henriette all of you for a great talk today talks today excuse me in plural um at least i very much enjoyed it i assume i speak for celine and carla and emma as well so um thank you all for coming and let's be in touch after this yeah okay thank, thank you, you very much, much. Yeah. So the next one is at the end of June. Next meeting. The next is one correct? is at the end of June, which is like okay. focusing on fair data. So yeah, do come along to okay. that. I can't remember the date exactly, but it's June. Actually, I think it's the thirtieth of June. It's like the last okay. week. Yeah, that's great. I will Thank send you. details and emails to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.